Kruger National Park. My name is Mark. Andrew is on camera. We have Tara in final control, our office that helps us broadcast to you wherever you are in the world. This is Juma Game Reserve. This is dawn at Juma Game Reserve with the wonderful sounds of the day waking up. We had, I think, to start a go-away bird that was the first to say hello this morning. There is an interesting deep woo woo of ground hornbills. I don't know if we're going to get to see them. I hope we're going to get to see them because they're very, very special. I heard some waterfowl down at the dam. We are in or at the very northeastmost corner of Juma. So we have the entire Juma Game Reserve and Arethusa Safari area to cover if we, we can get that far during the morning. But I hope you're going to join us and I hope you're going to spend the next three hours with us as we drive this vehicle around this beautiful part of the Game Reserve and see what animals we can find for you. I hope you enjoyed that sunrise as much as we did. It was a meditative moment of night. We've got a perfect temperature right now and quite beautifully the sky is clearing nicely as we can see this with this sunrise. Little bits of cloud. We had a shower during the night, came in at about Most of the night. I thought it would be rather chilly this morning, but it's actually turned into a really nice morning. Turn for you and we can get a better look at the beautiful vista of a rather big dam just above our northeast. Property known as Whittles Hook. signal there, but there's a, a little bit of a signal issue perhaps because of the dampness, but I was talking about this beautiful liquid core, and here are the culprits, mostly only during rains that we hear the magpie strikes in their morning song. Be interested to know if any of you have. I know some people, have, some of our viewers have parrots. It'd be interesting to know how your birds react to these noises. I know I've seen a few viewers whose cats react to some of the video that we that we broadcast. It's nice to know how other creatures that are enthralled or entertained.
pretty, pretty sound. The magpie shot. Now, only a few days ago, everything was starting to turn brown and yellow. In fact, it was predominantly a very beige and yellow background while we were driving. And it has become noticeably greener from this wonderful rain we had a few days ago. The odd shower that we've been getting since then is just helping to keep things moist and there's a little spurt of growth everything have been alarming just yet, maybe because it hasn't flown yet. It's a very special eagle. I'm expecting its mate to be around somewhere. Looks like it's going to be flying very, very soon. Unfortunately, it just turned around. It was facing us. Oh, I might be wrong. We might have to get a better look at him. Try and get closer to this child. If I go around onto the fire break. suggestions from some birders or non-birders or anybody wants to try their hand at eagle identification. One thing I couldn't see was whether it had feathered legs. I actually didn't even look at the monitor until we zoomed out because I was watching it through binoculars. If it had flown we would have been able to see with the wings, under wings, even the back of the eagle. But they're very pale in front. Aubrey's Road, shortcut. Right on. Our northern boundary. does offer us an opportunity to see which animals might have crossed in or out of, of the Juma area. The animals have a freedom that we don't have. We're a little bit uh, restricted in our movements here. We stay on Juma and we can go over to Arapusa, but the animals, of course, they've got millions of acres to move in. It's a whole great Kruger National Park. 
we're in a smaller part of that known as the Sabi Sand Game Reserve and even within that is this Juma Private Game Reserve. Like a suburb of a town in a city in New Jersey. That's kind of the analogy. Or a kibbutz in Israel, but this is Juma. Uh, into another one. A county. A farm in a county in the U UK. Well, maybe we're bigger than that. Bigger, smaller. Okay, let's see if we can find him again and creep up on this bird. Let's see it straight up in that dead city. Longer. Getting a shake. I think he's going to die. I don't want to get too close. Oh. Now, the interesting thing comes in. Did you hear that noise as it flew? Mm. Every bird in the area freak out. A lot of alarm calls, a lot of screeching. And it's flown further. Now, it's going to be very important to identify this bird. This is not, I don't think this is an African hawk eagle, which is what I first thought it was. But it definitely is an all white underpass. It's feathered legs all the way down. And it's got the white windows in the wings. And I've got an idea in my head, but I would like to have confirmation. I mean, like an airs hawk eagle. Because it doesn't have the spotty underpart. So we're going to have to try and sneak up on it again. Because if it is, it would be a very, very important eagle to spot and to see, as well as to have record of here in this part of the side. So I'm going to maybe fly, no? Please stay there, bird. Please, just want to look at you once more. <laughs> Seems to be getting a bit cloudy. If the move out, then off he goes. Bad signal. Flew off again, and I got another good look at, at the underparts, both under wings and its belly, its chest, and it is all white. It doesn't have the barring of the African hawk eagle, and it and it's have to get the book and show you why I think it is what I think it is. solitary because as it's moving I'm only hearing the birds around it reacting. If it had a mate around, well maybe the mate is around but not moving. If the mate was around we might have heard birds shouting alarms elsewhere. Yes, stop I saw. On 
camera. We turn the two wires around. Seems to have flown away further deeper into maybe deeper into Buffalo Zook, so I can't see where it's gone. And we have to We have to have a debate. I should have taken a photograph. African grey is mimicking a lot of the bird call. Especially the, the go away bird, yeah. Very luring. I heard ground hornbills up the way, but I think they too are in the Fuzuk. Now I need to find my reputable to show you. Open up the box. The African hawk eagle's got a very dark head. I suppose the juvenile is a completely different colour. It's brown, so it wasn't even if it was any breast. The long fisted the nellies. Oops, I just dropped the parrot feather. No, green fit. Here's hawk eagle. Uh, it's not airs. Yeah, well, airs is also very heavily streaked at the bottom. Airs doesn't have windows in the wings. So it wasn't an airs. Maybe it was an African hawk eagle that just wasn't very spotty. There's no other eagle that's so pale underneath other than that pale Wahlbergs that we had. And, well, he's gone back to other parts of Africa. It was too small to be a juvenile martial eagle. They don't have windows in their wings. Maybe African hawk eagle. But it's going to just have to remain one of those mysteries perhaps. And we can maybe get a consensus from some of the viewers that might have but I had a look at it. It was a lot though. I admit. Sometimes that first impression is the right impression. I mean, I first saw it from a distance. It's very much like an African hawk eagle, the right posture. But it was just too pale underneath.
Now we're turning into Juma. Also the boundary we're going to cross more, I suppose, more or less through a portion of it. And we'll try and touch on somewhere in the on the southern boundary. And this is also going to help us read what movement of animals there were, what is where, where we can find things. Because having done a fair little bit of this northwestern corner, I can see that there was one big elephant bull that headed west. And barely even touched on Juno. He went to an area along the northwestern boundary of the Sabi. Other than that, I can see that there was hippo that walked to that big dam we've just been watching. Jerry, morning Jerry, from Maryland. We do, Jerry, and get a lot of different migrant species that come through. Migrants that come from as far as Russia, Asia, Europe. Of course, there. Those are all what we call the Paleoarctic migrants. Then we have the inter-African migrants, migrants that come from other parts of Africa fly south, birds that, that migrate, but since we don't see them, they don't count. So at the moment, most of those seasonal birds, or what we call migrants, have left for warmer climates. So as it starts getting cooler and sun starts heading into the northern hemisphere. I think we'd be hard pressed to find any migrants still here. That's why I thought that can't really be the pale warbird. But it wasn't because it was too pale under the wings. Warbird wouldn't be pale under the wings like that. We can expect some of them to come back around September. Anyway, well, they start coming back in late August, early September, but some of them only come back as late as November, late November. You see, some of the migrants that come along, oh, well, a giraffe, gosh, big old Mrs. Giraffe standing here in the dip. Morning, madam. She looks a little bit damp, but she's also very dark for a, bit, for a lady giraffe.
there. And suddenly, the tallest mammal in Africa just disappears behind some bushes. Tallest mammal ever. I wonder, I don't think there's any way we can get a better look at her. I'll go back through the back of the strip. We don't have any little roads leading off. Of, so this is Gallagher shortcut. And the only road further up is going to be too far away. And the one behind us is too far away. I remember following Leopard on this old track. Let's see if we can get a better look at him. I have to get back to talking about birds in a bit. Still a little bit far around here, Andrew. Reversed again. Seems we're having some audio problems this morning. Hope that gets sorted out. Hope maybe this makes a difference. And Anne in California is saying she's she believes that giraffe have a very particular scent about them. Does it have any particular function? Uh, I, I could do Anne. Um, I think every animal has its own scent. Every animal has its, I guess you could call body odor. Most probably, just like elephants when they're in most, I suppose, giraffe bulls when their testosterone levels are up when they, when it's mating time, I guess they too can have a very musty smell about them. Um, and yes, it probably plays a very big role in 
sexual selection in terms of females maybe going for the stronger scented ones because it tells them that they are stronger that gives them some some um, signal that that particular male is more virile but I'm sure that that is, that is, is has to be said for almost all animals when it's mating time that's what pheromones are all about I want to see this follow this little old track just beyond this little marula tree in front of us and there might be a gap to see her a little bit better it's usually dark for a female giraffe a territorial tap. That's not the tap that you hear when they're digging for grubs in wood. So she's decided we're okay. She's going to go back to feeding, which is a nice sign that she's not concerned with us. this morning. <laughs> Ben. Ben's from Texas. Middle of the night in Texas. Ben was asking, what does a giraffe do protect, to protect itself from the thorns while it's feeding? And I, I mentioned that she's darker than normal. I didn't, I didn't really mean she's darker than normal. I just meant she's unusually dark for a female. Ben was also asking what is the difference between the colors and the, of the sexes. Generally speaking, Ben, the bulls tend to be darker than the cows. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't get darker females. And she's a perfect example of a relatively dark female. Also, females tend to lighten with age as bulls tend to darken with age, but it's not a hard and fast rule, and a lot of it has got to do with genetics. And very much like some of us have dark hair and some of us have lighter hair, giraffe have a variety of different shades of, of color, from this deep chocolate to sort of very, very pale, almost reddish, strawberry reddish, to tan color. I hope we get to see more giraffe and get an idea of some of the different shades of, of colour. Excuse me, that they that we can you can see them in. Um, as for the thorns, well, 
you find that the trees that have thorns are the trees that have been browsed on for millennia. They are the trees that have the best tasting leaves. And one of the reasons why they are thorns is because they've been browsed so heavily over millions of years. And so they've developed a, a, that physical defense. But nature isn't a very, not a very static environment. Everything has to adapt to changes. Pretty much change is dictated by differences in climate from decade or century to century. And so everything has to adapt to changes. So when trees that were browsed on, when they started developing thorns, or when their leaves started turning sharp because it was an, uh, an effort to, to d distract or rather discourage animals from feeding too much. The animals themselves had to adapt to that, so their, their mouth parts and their bodies adapted to be able to deal with the thorns. A giraffe has got a very, very thick tongue. She's got a fairly, fairly rough palate, and she'll wrap her tongue around the leaves and press it up against her palate and just strip the leaves off of a branch and the, the thorns are of, of, of no bother to her. She's watching something in the background. Look, look that way a couple of times. Now since her heads are mostly above the trees and they're able to see a lot further, you notice how white they are in the back of the head, the back of the ears, and that is to ha so that that white stands out when they are moving about. They can see another giraffe a long way away with its head in the bush feeding. Maggie in Vancouver. Morning, Maggie. Maggie wants to know how old she would be and what is her life expectancy. Well, Maggie, I, I'm guessing she's probably around in the late teens, maybe 20. It's very difficult to tell without really seeing how much wear there is on her teeth. She's an adult cow. She's well into adulthood. She's got quite a few wrinkles behind her, 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 her front legs, um, just, her, just her general size and I guess things like the, the shape of her face tell me she's not an old giraffe, she's in her prime, I'll tell you in a minute. She's standing now. She's not lactating, but she has, I think. Difficult to tell how old she is. Age or lifespan of a giraffe? It's probably around 25 years. Hello, Mrs. G. Beautiful light in her eyes when she looks in the right direction.
There's a spur fowl in the background that's calling. I'll drink your beer, I'll drink your beer, I'll drink your beer. But there was another even more important bird that was calling. See, as, as she walks through the, the quarry, all the water droplets that are falling off the leaves shows how heavy these trees are with dew and rain. She's probably enjoying it while wow, she's brushing against the bushes like that. I come and eat some buffalo thorn. Excuse me, I'm just going to talk on the radio. Taxing, taxing. Good no, morning, for uh, I don't think anyone's at me, been to Misi Kaya. I've got one Mavazi Lamiti on Gallagher Shortcut. She's just be she's east of the road, just before Ephraim shortcut, but she's quite deep in the chatin. Yeah, there's an old ndlele that comes in, probably from an old bamba or something. I'm sitting on that. You can see it on that old ndlele. Yeah, she's making her way towards Ephraim shortcut. Yeah, I mean after you go to Misikai, if you check um, that other shortcut, you might find her. This is Mark, go ahead. Tlamiti on Gallagher shortcut. And so we need to move along. Sorry, repeat that please. Yeah, firm. Uh, I, I hear Texans out as well. Yeah, I did. Has anybody checked if they've gone back over Gary Main or if they've gone up to Cheetah Cutline? Okay, copy. I'll make my way to maybe to Mumba Road or Batalia. Something for us to do this morning, since there's some tracks that have crossed over from the south at Twin Dams and while well, she's heading deeper into the bush we're gonna head south honey we were heading south and we're only gonna have a look there are some tracks of some cats They are still on Duma.
is not far from Gary Dam or Juma Waterhole, so it's possible that she might be browsing, making her way around to the water later today. There is a lot of moisture on the leaves, a lot of well, they're very wet leaves, so it could be that she's not that dependent on water today. of animal that has attracted the attention of, of humans in too many ways. Uh, they're very, very placid, they're very, very gentle creatures. And they also don't invade crops, so there isn't this animal-human conflict that we have with maybe some of the other animals that are endangered because of either human conflict or because humans have some sick need for some part of that animal and so they've been hunted for that. So very, from, very much from a point of view of giraffe have been mostly left alone and mostly revered by humans who would hope that secures their future on the planet. As long as they're trees, there's going to be giraffe. Question from Terry in Florida wanting to know what do giraffe do to stay away from predators? How do they deal with uh, apart from their camouflage? The camouflage doesn't really help them too much, Terry. The excuse me a sec. Um, they're just rather large animals, and they they've got fairly large hooves, so they, they make enough noise that if there were cats around, the cats would hear them. The way they defend themselves, of course, is that they are able to kick both with their front and their back legs. They're able to strike forward and sideways with their front legs, and they're able to strike, they're able to kick out with their back legs. Also, slightly different to a horse, they can kick almost sideways with their, with their back legs. And many a lion has had a has 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 been kicked by a giraffe during a hunt. And perhaps their speed. They 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 given an open area like this, they could probably run faster than the lion and of course lion can't sustain speed and, and the sprint for very long and very often lion try will will give up on the hunt. But of course, they can't always defend themselves and giraffe eventually will maybe get slower over time and old giraffe, often old giraffe are killed by lion. Lion are pretty much the only predator unless some of the other predators have learned how to take baby giraffe. I've known leopard to take young giraffe, uh, hyena have taken young giraffe. So there are different animals that, that might prey on young giraffe but it's mostly lion that will feed on adults. And it's all, usually it's just because of the pride more than anything else, being able to, a large number of lions being able to... Morning. Morning. Very good in you. Good, thank you. Good, all well. Yeah, see anything exciting? Giraffe, beautiful giraffe. See you later. Just greeting staff here at, from, from Juma. 
kind of courtesy that when we f see another vehicle come by, and well, maybe it doesn't stand today, but usually it's quite dusty. So you stop and you say hello and find out what you've seen and give a chance for the dust to settle, but it's also just a nice friendly gesture. tracks in the road and I see some wildebeest up ahead. But I was saying giraffe have been hunted by cheetah, small giraffe, because they've learned how to do it and they perhaps do it collectively or, or as a coalition. And of course lion hunt giraffe because they hunt collectively, they'll hunt as a pride and it might not be easy for one lion to do so, but certainly if two or three or more lion make it a lot easier to bring down a giraffe. Have to get it on the ground and a lot of times lions have learned how to hunt giraffe or they will hunt them in the specific conditions when it's slippery or wet or rocky terrain the little roller before we get to the wildebeest is a little lilac breasted roller puffed up in the morning sun don't see it and the uh, apple leaf. But I'm trying to see would it be better to have a sky background. Maybe this will work. Skies or leaves. Leaves. That's nice. Little frame. All puffed up because it's a little damp and because it's probably a little bit cold. And much like the animals raise the hair on their bodies to increase the air between the hairs that help insulate the body better in cooler temperatures, birds do very much the same thing. They puff up the feathers, uh, increases the air pockets between the feathers, and that helps retain warmth better. When we get cold, we get goosebumps. Our hair does the same thing, but I don't know how much warmer it makes us because we don't have much hair or air between our hair. That's for Linda. We're getting some pretty light now because this cloud is easing up in the east and a bit of blue sky coming through. That puts it all into perspective. That's a nice shot if we were a little bit. If you could get the camera as low as I am, that will be standing almost on the ridge. I'm not going to see it from here. I'll we'll have to go back. About five of them, I think. Mm. 
was a hornbill that just flew down right out of the cluster leaf. I think we need to go around there. We'll see them from the other side. We'll get really good light on them. I want to go down towards the dam. Now here, a couple of the guys are following up on some lion tracks that have come across twin dams. They still haven't seen much. So I'm thinking that these cats have possibly walked even further north. Although well, they don't seem to have found anything yet around the Mawati River. But there's a good chance. Good chance. Here you are, Mr. W. These old ladies that have come in. Like number six. Now, I'm wondering if this is the same herd that we've had in the summer. This bull has clearly made this one of his chief breeding spots. His lick, his bowl, his territory. And I guess he's hoping that these ladies are going to stay here and he gets to mate with them. They could decide that he's not good enough and go and find another male to live with. them a little later but I'd like to while it's still cool see if we can Later, Mr. Goon. This is the brindled gnu. It's in this light that you see the brindled stripe patterns. Actually, that is our side light in on him. You can see a monarch flittering around too at the moment.
rolling. Shatter his. Domain. <coughs> Why did we know? I thought maybe he'd roll over. Or... Yeah, he might okay. dig a little. He might also put his horns into the sand, just all scenting, making this his territory, rubbing, or we'll be noticing some place where he's rubbing his horns on the trees, but he's also, he's getting his scent in his, around him and he's getting the, his surroundings descent on him. Yeah. Mm, not quite. Maybe he just wants to sit down. Not even going to roll. Thought he was going to dig a bowl. He has got a bowl just behind us. Let's go back a little bit and I'll show you. Where he's dug quite a lot and he's a bit rolling. He will probably also put his droppings in it, and when that gets a little bit dry, he rolls in that. To keeps his scent and keeps his scent around him and around his territory. See you later, Mr. Goo, once again. We'll go and find the cats, I'll let you know where they are. Oh, it's a considerable herd of wildebeest that has come in. Not just... The five that we saw, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, six, seventeen odd. Let's go to the front of the herd. This is a, a youngster with a very beige forehead. Nasty, chasing the child. That's probably one of the the youngest. It was late November, so going on about six months, I guess. Five months. Count properly. Five months. It's like a herd of lawnmowers approaching us. Yes. We have a wall of wildebeest approaching. Mm. If they stampede now, they'll run. Right. No, they won't.
they're also not very aggressive animals. They do turn on their predators and they certainly use those horns in defense. You can see how the shape of the horns becomes a pretty good weapon. And when a wildebeest needs to, just by side, by, by swinging its head side to side, brings into play those curved horns. Well, the older females just turned around and decided to, oh, she got a fright, something under that bush. She got a fright. I'll have to investigate. She just decided to take her herd away. Another group sort of following. I don't know how to explain this. Just a couple of family groups all coming together. Maybe forming one big herd for for now, we might be very lucky to have them here with the grasses greening up the way they are. Diane in Michigan, why aren't we seeing oxpeckers on the wildebeest? I can hear oxpeckers in the trees, Diane. Why are we not seeing oxpeckers? I'm not sure. Sabria wants to know if it's a large termite mound in the background. Just in, just in front of these wildebeest, I guess that is a fairly large termite mound. It's not exceptionally large, but it is fairly large. It probably stands uh, about five, maybe six feet tall. There's another one for even further in the background behind the front group of wildebeest. Very healthy termite mound. And to some degree because of the, the, the action of the termites and having trace elements return to the soil. Laura, morning, Laura. From Chicago. I mean, Illinois is still reeling after a pretty bad, what was it, a tornado there a while ago. I think to know if these wildebeest migrate. Not really, not these wildebeest here in Kruger, Laura.
These ones don't migrate. Movement in different areas, but not real migration. This is probably one of the largest groups of wildebeest we will ever see. Out here, we normally only see small herds, but this, I would guess, is actually the two herds together. And it's fairly large for this terrain, for this habitat type. They are mostly graze it well they're mostly out in the open areas especially they need to be at night so they might be grazing in in the bushy areas amongst the trees during the day and uh, that's particularly also because of the heat and the shade that they get from it they get the grazing between the trees But when it comes to nightfall, they like to be out in the open. It's safer for them. They can run away from predators better. So that it's not that usual for them to accumulate like this. Um, because this is just a very much larger open area than usual. A group like this in thicker bush would be very, quite vulnerable to predation by lion or hyena because, well, the thicker bush, things make a noise that's harder to keep in contact with each other. No. And I guess this is getting a bit concerned that the ladies are wandering a little bit too far. He's still there by his marula tree. Yep. Yeah. Let's continue. That's been interesting. Still want to go and follow up and see what's happening to these cats. Romain wants to know what the mortality rate is of young wildebeest. It's actually quite high, Romain, because there aren't that many open areas like this. And a lot of the open areas that wildebeest do seem to hang out on are airstrips. Now, Lion get to know the open areas and they get to know them pretty well. So, to, to hyena, to leopard, perhaps. In fact, there's a there's perhaps a decline in wildebeest numbers then over the years.
You can see she looked up, you could hear a, a roller giving an alarm. But we're going through this part. Keep your eyes on the camera at Juma Waterhole because they might be heading down there later. And that question from Rumei came via Twitter, by the way. She tweeted us at hashtag Safari Live. You can do that if you want to send in questions, or if you would prefer to send an email, email us at questions at wildearth.tv. Look at this, this whole group now coming together. And the mail is coming this way too. So, I'm still drawn to stay here and see quite a lovely thing quite a large group of wildebeest if I can just get in front of this marula tree we can get to see the male too it'd be nice to see if there is any interaction between them everybody welcome to Juma hope you like our green green grass had it rain especially for you bulk up for the dry season not that it'll last long brownish forehead but the lighter brown forehead and you can see see the size of the horn it does give you a little bit of an indication of their youth and their size I suppose as well but if we look at some of them some of them there's some older females who are getting quite dark on the forehead but generally the females have a lighter forehead well, we're going to have a have them all moving past us soon. In fact, they're coming close enough. We might be able to hear them grazing. Oh, they're all going to go behind us. Several of them crossing behind us already. And when one goes, they all just follow. Yes. It's quite amazing, actually. Yeah. Maybe some of them will cross ahead. They're actually crossing and coming around. No, they're all going to follow. <laughs> they're not going to go around. There's the, there's the bull. Midi. Pleading with them to come back. 
and they want to go down to the water. I think he's, I wonder if he's going to try and hurt them. Or well, he's just keeping, keeping to the edge of his, his bowl. Keeping him in sight, perhaps. Listening to the radio and wasn't thinking. No, this is good as well. Texan, come in. Now, Tex, I'm at Gary Dam. I'm going to make my way down there. Okay, I'll join you shortly. Right. It is time to leave these children be. We have something to go and see. Something very exciting, I hope. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Follow me. Let's go. Like you have a choice. Well, you do. But if you go anywhere now, nah, you're going to miss out on something special.
maybe it's not even an animal. Maybe it's a beetle. Or a spider. No. No, it is an animal. It's an animal that has just crossed the Milwati River and is making its way to twin dams to drink, I hope. And although we 